Hey, we have a special edition of Locked On Braves today as we have a very special guest with us in Atlanta Braves Hall of Famer, Dell Murphy. Very excited to be doing this interview. Very grateful to have him on. So it should be a very exciting episode of Locked On Braves. So let's get into it. Hey, this is Stacey Gotsoulias, DC Lundberg, Ryan Finkelstein, Taylor Blake Ward, host of Locked On Yankees, Locked On Mariners, Locked On Mets, Locked On Angels, and you're listening to Locked On Braves. Locked On Braves. Locked On Braves. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where we talk about your favorite teams every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. Check out my bio there to see everywhere I am covering the game of baseball, including the Atlanta Braves over at tomahawktake.com. Also, make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On underscore Braves. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the Locked On Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast, as well as on YouTube. And thank you for making Locked On Braves your first listen each and every day. We post episodes daily, five days a week, Monday through Friday, and we are free and available on all platforms. On today's podcast, got a very special interview for you. Going to be talking to Dale Murphy. So very excited about this opportunity to have him on the podcast. Let me go ahead and bring in Dale here. Hey, Dale, thanks so much for joining the podcast. I appreciate you so much for being on here. Thanks for having me on, Jake. Can you hear me okay? Everything going okay? Yeah. From your end? Things great. Yep. Got you on here. Um, so, yeah, excited to have uh, have you on. Um, in case some Thank of you, you. don't you. know, um, Dale Murphy, 18-year big league career from 1976 to 1993, 15 of those in Atlanta. Career 265, 346, 469 hitter with an 815 OPS, 398 home runs, 1,197 runs scored, over 1,200 RBIs, over 2,000 hits, 161 stolen bases. Don't forget about that speed now. You got the, the stolen bases there. Seven-time All-Star, two-time MVP winner, five-time Gold Glover, four-time Silver Slugger, top 10 in Braves history in war among position players, games played, runs, scores, hits, total bases, doubles, home runs, RBI walks, and extra base hits. Um, also leads the team or leads the franchise history in strikeouts. What do you think about that? Oh well, I was just—I I was just going to say I, I'm going to uh, listen to your intro there every morning, so I feel good. Yeah, but then until I came, ended with you that, came up with, yeah, then you came up with the truth. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm uh, sure with the way the I, game is I, played today, I, somebody will catch you in that that category yeah, pretty that's soon. That—that's that, a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> um, no, but obviously an outstanding career. I, I mean, one Thank of the you. best players in, in franchise history. And you hear all those numbers and, you know, I'm sure you hear those every time you go on a, a podcast or do an interview. But when you look back, you know, on your career from beginning to end, you know, just kind of take me through the journey. Because I know, obviously, it's a grind for any player to come up, you know, and make it to the big leagues. But then to have a sustainable, you know, 18 year career, just kind of, you know, give us, you know, briefly kind of your path to the big leagues and uh, you and able to keep that longevity and stay there for 18 years. Well, thank you for the question because I don't often, you know, I, I get to speak around the country and I love telling my baseball story and, and uh, things I've learned from baseball, but a lot of times, uh, uh, but I, I like to share my path to the major leagues because uh, unless you followed me from the early days, a lot of people don't realize that I was drafted as a catcher uh got the yips i guess is the best way to say it uh kind of got out of that but my throwing really never got uh good enough to be an everyday catcher uh, then i moved to first base and things didn't work out well there i led the league in errors i think and uh, in 1978 uh don't look that up just just for my peace my peace of mind uh but uh but so my path was really kind of crooked i did not you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do in the minor leagues. So when, when catching didn't work out, I was like, there were times when I really wanted to quit. And uh, 
couple interesting things happened. I started hitting a lot better. I start. I think 1977 in AAA, I had over 20 home runs. And that was the first time in my minor league career I hit over 20. And I might even hit 300 that year. I don't know. But uh, Bobby moved me to first base. Bobby Cox was there. And then in 1979, he called me up. He goes, Murph, we're, we're, what do you think about playing in the outfield? And I was excited because I, I knew I wasn't going to stay as a catcher or a first baseman. I think I caught about 100 games in the big leagues. I'm not sure. I, I think I caught Phil Necro's 200th win. So, I mean, I was around, but I didn't know. And then he moved me to the outfield in 1980, and I ended up going to my first All-Star game in 1980 as an outfielder. And so my career was uh, was directly tied to Bobby Cox's moving me to the outfield. I mean, I wouldn't have had a career without Bobby. And then I started hitting better. I started hitting some home runs, driving in runs. And so, uh, but I think the point is you just, you just never know. I, I there were times when I wanted to quit and, uh, and uh, my career wouldn't have lasted as long, even if I was an everyday catcher, it just, it just doesn't work out that way, obviously, because of the, the wear and tear. So I was able, thankfully to Bobby and the Atlanta Braves organization to get, get to have a career and end up in the outfield and and that's what saved my career it really did yeah no that's a really interesting story awesome story because i honestly did not know you played catcher until i started uh you know researching for the interview and saw that you you did play catcher the first couple of years you know in the big league so yeah i appreciate you sharing that because you know, it's just interesting to me to hear these stories of players and just you know one simple thing from a, a coach a position change you know a little tweak in a in a batting stance, you know, really can just change a career. I mean, you went on to have an 18-year career um, because of that. So really interesting uh, story there. I appreciate you sharing that. Who are some players that inspired you as a kid? Because the big thing for me, you know, as a young baseball fan, you know, like I watched Ozzie Smith growing up. So I wanted to be the best defensive shortstop, you know, ever. You know, that's what that's who I watched. And, you know, if anytime he was on TV, you know, that's who I ran to watch. That's who I wanted to play, uh, emulate my game after. Was there somebody like that for you growing up that you really looked up to? Yeah, so I was I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon. And we had minor league baseball there, um, uh, AAA in Portland. And I remember going to games with my dad. And, uh, you know, the early names that I remember – of guys that made it to the big leagues. We had Sam McDowell there. We had Louis Tion. I think there was a catcher named Duke Sims. There was an infielder named Chico Simone. So I remember those names as a kid. But then my fifth and sixth grade year, I think it was fifth and sixth grade year, my dad, uh, uh, for two years, we lived in the Bay Area. My dad worked for Westinghouse down in San Francisco. And then seventh, and then seventh grade, we moved back to Portland, and that's where I went uh, to high school, and got drafted uh, while I was in Portland, Oregon. But anyway, for those two years, uh, I was in the Bay Area. If you were in the Bay Area, and that was probably uh, I was born in '56, so that was probably, you know, '67, '68. Uh, you were a Willie Mays fan. <laughs> mm, yeah. There's no question, no question about it. So. Willie was just, I, I just remember going to Giants games and uh, I mean, Willie McCovey was there, Willie Mage, uh, you know, they had some really good teams. Um, and Willie Mays is, was the guy. So Willie Mays was the first guy. Uh, my dad got me a Willie Mays mitt. And uh, so that's what I remember. Now, when I moved back to Portland and, uh, you know, in the seventies, if you were a catcher, uh, you probably became a Johnny Bench fan. So. So Johnny Bench was my guy when I was when I became a catcher in high school. I was like, oh man, he's he's amazing, and and so the, when I usually really have two Willie Mays and Johnny Bench. Yeah, those are pretty two two good players to try to emulate <laughs> your game after and look up to. So yeah, uh, for sure. Um, and then you know you talked about Bobby Cox and your time in Atlanta and just you know the, p the position changed there. Um, and Anytime, you know, I know your time didn't overlap with Hank Aaron in Atlanta as a player, but obviously, you know, I know you got to know him. You know, anytime I have somebody on who, who has history with Hank, you know, I, I got to kind of just ask you your thoughts on him, not necessarily as a player, because look, I didn't grow up watching Hank Aaron. You know, I wasn't born yet. I didn't have that privilege. 
But what I know about Hank is more so off the field. And that's where he really inspires me. That's where I really look up to him is just what he did off the field, you know, in the community, inspiring generations after him. Um, and obviously, you know, his passing this past year, um, you know, just if you can give me your your thoughts, what you uh, learned from Hank, what you uh, had gathered from from Hank here and in your time with him. Yeah, exactly. We didn't we didn't overlap. In fact, I was drafted in 1974, so I went to rookie ball. But in spring of 1975 was my first spring training uh, with the Braves as a as a minor league catcher. And Hank got traded that winter. So he was with Milwaukee in 1975. So I missed him even in spring training. Um, and then uh, when he retired and came back to work for the Braves and was the minor league uh, director of player personnel, I think, was his title. I was in the big leagues. So we didn't we didn't uh, we, we missed each other professionally, um, but he was there. Uh, what I remember, one of the things I remember is, you know, Hank, Hank had his job. He was the minor league director. And uh, I, I know he's watching us play. His office, of course, there was at Fulton County Stadium. He'd come down and talk to us about hitting, but he was very careful about that. He didn't come down unless he was invited. And he just wanted to respect the hitting coaches and, and uh, you know, their job. He didn't want to. But, but I, he did come down a few times and talk to me about hitting. And I was like, well, I would do that if I was Hank Aaron, but I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but he was just... He was just tremendous. Um, he kind of, to me, he kind of set the tone of what it means to be a professional ball player, to be an Atlanta Brave. And I've always felt, uh, you look at his numbers, uh, Joe Posnanski wrote a, a book just recently, a great book, called The Baseball 100. And I was really curious to see who he put in, in his number one player. It's not really a ranking, but it, it kind of is a ranking. But I think he had Hank, you know, like three or four, I think Babe Ruth was two and Willie Mays was number one. And I said, I said to Joe, I said, I got a little argument with you. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, I just put Willie Mays as one. But here's what I think about Hank. Uh, I think he's the best player overall ever in the history of the game. And uh, the reason why I say that is the degree of difficulty. Um, when you look at the African-American players during those times, and even now there's still racism exists. But when when he's approaching Babe Ruth's record and breaks Babe Ruth's record and then says 20 years later, it was the worst year of my life. Um, you know, that says something about what he went through. And I'm, I'm, Willie went through the same things in the minor leagues, you know, not being able to stay at the same hotel as the white players. Uh, it's hard enough to be a professional baseball player. But then when you're discriminated against in so many ways and get so much hate mail and you, 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 you go through your career with stuff that I never had to worry about. I, I don't know how he did it. And I don't know uh, how uh, any of the, the black players back then did it actually. And like I said, even today, I think there's still some things that exist that, that challenge uh, African-American players. For sure. And so, so it just really opened my mind that man, what Hank did was, absolutely incredible and then you add the de degree of difficulty that he had i think i think he's incomparable i think the uh you know he i know barry bonds surpassed him in home runs i think he's got a record that i don't think i think total bases i think is the record that you know no one will ever no one will ever be he also probably could have had a lot more than one mvp but back then you know this the this the the, the, the the league was so condensed you know, every year you're going against, you know, the just like the top 10 guys in the history of the game. Mm -hmm. And I know he won one MB, one MVP, but you look at his numbers. I mean, it's incredible. I think Ted Williams won the triple crown and lost the MVP and did win the MVP. So <laughs> yeah. That tells you what it, what it was like back then to, to win an MVP. But yeah. uh, Hank was incredible, incredible person. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. Like I said, for me, I didn't grow up watching him, but he's one of my favorite players of all time, just because of what I know about him, what you talked about, you know, knowing what he went through yeah, and, and what he did, you know, both well, on and off the field. Right. And what he, you know, what he did off the field, of course, is great legacy. Getting back on the field, here's an interesting, uh, I took, you know, I, I take a group, uh, 
Uh, I have an MVP experience, we call it. And if anybody's interested, you can go to dalemurphy.com. But we have an MVP experience, about five or six of them a year, where we take a group and, and I spend the day with them and during the game. But we also take a tour, take the tour of, uh, of Truist Park. And I'm with them on the tour. But anyway, when we get to the Hank Aaron place uh, in Monument Garden, I think they call it Monument Gardens, we start talking about Hank. Uh, one of the, the guides this year reminded me of how many stolen bases Hank had. But for the, during the 60s, or during most of his career, stolen bases weren't even a thing he tried. It wasn't a thing to try. And uh, I mean, once he started stealing bases, he, he didn't steal less than 20 a year for, I, I don't know how many years, but it was just, it's interesting to see, um, you know, what, I played great defense. I mean, he hit a million home runs, and as we know, and total bases. Uh, never hit 50 um, in one year. Uh, was so consistent. But his all-around game was was more impressive than than the baseball even allowed or not allowed, but it wasn't even a thing, you know. And mm -hmm. then he didn't strike out. I mean, hardly at all. So, I mean, it's cra crazy numbers. He's got some crazy numbers. Yeah, no, certainly the the best of all time in in my mind. Um, so yeah, great to hear you know your thoughts on him as well. Uh, I want to take a quick break and then come back and ask some more questions about the current Braves team. Before we do that, let me tell you about Built Bar. This holiday season, grab the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar or even better than a candy bar. Built Bar filled with so much holiday goodness, rich with decadent flavor, covered in chocolate, but amazingly low in calories, sugar, net carbs, and fat, and high in protein. You get the best of both worlds, delicious and healthy. So many flavors, you'll have a hard time choosing. You have raspberry or mint brownie, cherry or double chocolate, cookies and cream or peanut butter brownie. Built Bar gives you that extra fuel you need to bust down all those mall doors and battle the holiday shoppers. Or if you like that marshmallowy treats you around the holidays, you can get some of their Built Bar puffs. Go to built.com, use promo code locked 15 to get 15% off your order. That's locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. Stance Apparel is some of the softest, most comfortable apparel out there the apparel is very soft and entirely unique it's a lot of fun to wear and it's something you'll love purchasing for you and others stance gives you a sense of confidence simply by feeling good found in 2009 stance apparel represents a radical reinvention of socks underwear and active apparel with sharp focus on comfort quality and creativity stance brings an atypical aesthetic alongside some of pop culture's hottest collaborators Go, go see for yourself. Register for an account at stance.com and get 15% off your purchase when you use our promo code locked on at checkout. Again, that's locked on at checkout for 15% off your purchase. All right. So, Dale, looking at the 2021 team, truly a, a magical season. Could I interrupt you? Yeah, go ahead. I'm a built bar fan. Are you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I should have brought you into the promo yeah. there. What, what's your favorite flavor? Yeah. Oh, just any of them. I any just, of them? I, I, I was with the, uh, I don't know what his position, except that about six years ago, he goes, hey, uh, come into my office. I want you to try my, my latest project. I'm, I just bought a company. They make protein bars. I was like, yeah, okay. And he, he goes, try this. I go, well, it tastes like candy, so you're going to sell a million of them. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. It's right in the promo read. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Well, there's a good plug for yeah. Built Bar. Um, yeah. But but looking at this this 2021 yeah. team for the Braves, a truly magical season. The way things came together, you know, Alex rebuilding an entire outfield at the trade deadline. What impressed you the most about this 2021 Braves team? Wow. There is so many talking points uh, about this team and the things that impress me. Um, I'm trying in my mind to pick one out. Well, the theme I always go, I'm going back to all the time because, you know, I love Brian Snit here and what, what Brian and Ronnie have been through during their career. But I think about not being very good for, you know, half, or just being average, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, they were 500, whatever, you know, in second or third place. And then, you know, all the stories, you know, Acuna goes down and, and situation happens there with uh, Ozuna and um, uh, uh, Soroka doesn't come back to scheduled, has, has, a, 
as a problem. And there's obviously some other things that are going on. But I think about Brian Snitker and his leadership because I don't know, I think, and, and, and Alex Anthopoulos too, is like really easy to fold and just kind of go, well, you know, we'll do our best. But, but I think they looked at the Eastern division and said, well, it's still up for grabs, you know, let's do our best on, on the trades and see what happens. And then, you know, they all worked out, but I credit, but I credit this anytime a championship is won, it's the whole, it's the whole organization, but wow, this, this is a scout and a coach victory to me. Um, meaning, meaning the scouts who are deciding on who to trade and, and, and the coaches that are looking at film and should we get this guy? Solaire, you know, I think the last two weeks before he came to the Braves looked really good and they thought, hey, I think we think he's turned a corner. I think he was hitting around 200, you know, before then. Yeah. And just just all those decisions that go on off the field to put it together, a team that could still be competitive and and get Jock Peterson and Rosario. And and then, you know, it doesn't always click. But what you got to do is you've got to you got to form a culture that increases your chance of success. It doesn't mean it's always going to happen. So I look at Brian Snicker as creating a culture of a team that never gives up, goes out, doesn't look behind, doesn't look forward, concentrates on that day and tries to win. And then look what happens. It snowballed. They get some momentum. You know, their pitching was maligned during a lot of the year, their bullpen. And then all of a sudden, you know, Oh, okay. Then they get they they get it to the World Series and Charlie Morton breaks his leg. Yeah. I mean, it was just like, well, of course he broke his leg. You know, what else? What else do you expect? So, I just think about resilience when I think about this team. Gee whiz, it's just an incredible story of hanging in there. And I think the manager sets the tone for that. Yeah, I don't know how many managers could have weathered the storm of all of that and still you know, been able to keep the team motivated to just continue to go. You know, it seemed hit after hit. You know, it seems like every World Series team has their struggles they have to get through you know, before they accomplish, you know, greatness. But sure, he, like you said, you have to have a manager, somebody at the top that's continuing to keep them motivated, you know, letting them know what's in front of them. So um, another thing I wanted to talk to you about is Freddie Freeman. And obviously we're hopeful that, you know, he's going to resign with the Braves. I, I feel like he will. I feel pretty confident in that, but... Until it actually gets done, everybody in Braves country is going to be rather nervous. But, you know, it seems like the Braves have always had that position player in the clubhouse. I mean, when you go from Hank Aaron, pass the torch to you, pass the torch to Chipper Jones, and now you got Freddie Freeman as that face of the franchise player. But I just wanted to get your thoughts, you know, on Freddie Freeman as, you know, a kid who came up, you know, team was pretty good when he came up, but then he goes through a rebuild, sticks with the team, and now here he is, you know, takes the team to the World Series and wins the World Series. Um, so just your thoughts, you know, on Freddie Freeman, his journey, what he means to this team and this city. Oh, I, I think, uh, you know, like you say, his leadership, uh, his uh, ability to go out there every day. And just, I, I'll tell you one thing. I, I thought it was one of the more remarkable performances during the playoffs when he had seven straight strikeouts and he bounced back from that. Mm -hmm. Uh, now people say, well, you know, he's Freddie Freeman. He's a good hitter, but, and that's, yeah, that's true. But the point is that that could have gone south. I, it, it, Fred, Freddie's much better hitter than I am, but people don't understand. Sometimes we're kind of at a psychological knife edge <laughs> where our confidence is really good. You know, people see it on TV and they make it, you know, they go, oh, you know, it, it looks relatively easy. It's just not that easy. But when Freddie bounced back, from those seven at bats, I was like, that is remarkable. I know I've been there and I'm like, that is really hard. That I'm not saying he, he could have gone into a, a deep slump. I put yeah. it that way. I mean, you see that uh, during the regular season with players, right? I mean, you have ups and downs yeah. throughout the regular season. He had to turn it around in two games and figure it out. Basically. Right. Right. So I credit him. I credit the coaches. I know they worked hard, but he went to LA, had a day off and he got a couple of hits to left field got his stroke back. I'm just saying, even as good as he is, there, there, there are times when things can go south and he's in the playoffs. Mm. I mean, 
that was a, just a remarkable performance to me. Uh, I think we all know what he means to this team, means to the community. He said he wants to be a, a Brave his whole career. He's been very, you know, forthright about that. Uh, but I'm nervous. I, I'm, I, 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 well, I, I just want to say what he means to this team, too, is defensively. Um, I don't know how many runs over the course of his career he's saved, how many errors he's saved, um, and how many double plays he's turned, which is a, is a tough play, a first to second, back to first double play. That's just, it's just not easy. He, he's great defensively. So I, I, that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, I, I, and I'm just concerned about them signing him uh, because of, it's taken a long time. And I know why. We all know why. But there's other clubs that really want him. And uh, I think you, you have to understand that there, there are going to be clubs probably that are going to offer more money in more years. I mean, it's just – no. probably going to happen and he's going to have to make a decision you know and uh it's good it's going to be fascinating to watch because he is such a key part he'll always be atlanta brave no matter where he goes um you know he'll wear a atlanta brave hat into the hall of fame he's an atlanta brave in a home run his last at bat in the world series i'm just i'm just you know i'm I, i'm just i'm nervous <laughs> i'll just put it that way yeah. because because the reality is he's going to get offered a, a lot of money mm -hmm. and it's hard to leave that on the table. And he's probably going to ask for a few more years. And I, I don't know. We'll see. We it's everybody's tight lipped about it. So it it's hard to figure out, but the fact that it's taken a long time and you know, it's by design, uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know what to say. It's going to be, <laughs> I, 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 look, I love Freddie. There's no question about it. I, I got to tell you, though, I'm nervous. I don't have any yeah. inside scoop. <laughs> right. No, you, you're but right I'm there with, with us and all the listeners. We, we are just as nervous and on the edge of our seats as well. Like, we want this done as soon as possible. But, yes, yeah. I, I feel your nervousness. Well, it, it, yeah, we got another complication with this lockout, and they got the CBA they got to talk about. I know there's been some early free agent signings and I would love to have seen him be one of those early free agents that signed before this formality of the lockout happened and, you know, wrap this thing up. But, you know, uh, you know, I, I just like everybody else, I know he's got two homes and one of them is in Southern California. So, yep. <laughs> yep. You know, so uh, I don't know what to say. I, yeah. I'm nervous about it. Yeah. No, I, I think, you know, it's that possibility, like you said, which is in the back of my mind. Somebody yeah. could very easily come up and just hand him seven years, 200 million plus or whatever it is. And it's, you know, would the Braves match that? And that is the that well, is the, the, the scary thing. Someone just told me about I, I miss Seager's signing with Texas from mm -hmm. the Dodgers. Correct. Correct. Yep. So well, they got some do money. You have, <laughs> do, you, do you have the ballpark figure, so to speak, that that Seeger signed for? Uh, I can look it up uh, real quick. But I think his was like 10 years. Um, ten, 10 years? Yeah, I think so. I know he's younger than Freddie, but... Yeah, 10-year ten, ten deal. Um, 325 million. I think the similar well, one they comped him to was Marcus Simeon, because they're about the same age. I think Simeon signed for... Somewhere around seven years, 175 million, something like that. Yeah. Um, I think that was one of the I, I comps. Mean, I don't know how many years Freddie's going to ask for, but I imagine around five or six. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be the, uh, that'll be the, <laughs> it's going to be crazy, but there's a lot of money out there. And, you know, Freddie's probably interested in seeing what his worth is out there. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I and I totally understand that. That's the, right. You know, you yeah. got it. You got to you got to respect that. Yeah, for sure. I would take one more break here. Let me ask a couple of more questions for Dale. Before we do that, let me tell you about Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered all season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football season continues to march to the playoffs, Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. 
Head to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code Locked On to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. So I know you, you touched on it briefly just a second ago, talking about the lockout. Um, you know, what are your just kind of thoughts on the situation? Not asking you to pick sides, but, um, you know, obviously a lot of this always has to do with financial things. And I'm sure you've gone through some of these talks, you know, negotiations in your career, but just your take on the lockout in general, do you think it's going to affect, you know, games or the start of the season? Well, I'm hopeful. I think, People I've talked to said they think spring training might get delayed, but spring training's a little long anyway. But I would feel bad for the cities that host spring training games because that's, you know, really lucrative for them. But I'm hopeful that if anything gets delayed, it'll only be spring training that will start the season on time. But yeah, I, I am not up on the issues. Obviously, it's they're, it's money, but, but, uh, um, yeah, I've been through them. They're no fun. Uh, I think since they missed the work, canceled the World Series in 94, you know, we haven't had any uh, labor problems. I've missed, uh, I was involved in two strikes in 81. I missed 56 games right in the middle of the season. And then uh, there was another shorter one, about 10 games or a week. I can't remember in 88. I can't remember. Somebody reminded me of that. But yeah, I've been through these things and they're not fun. And I think hopefully we're in the era of getting these things worked out when i was in the era of a lot of fighting bickering and but you know I, i'll just say this as an aside um we were always taught that what we're doing this is for the future players and the ability to maximize their earning potential and so even though i'm jealous of today's players and what they're making i feel like in a small part you know, the earlier generation and even before me sacrificed games and reputations for the good of the players now. Um, case in point, um, Ronald Acuna signed a huge contract. Uh, a lot of people say oh, $100 million, whatever, uh, and then blew out his knee, you know, mm -hmm. the next year. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. And, and uh, you got to take advantage of it and you got to you got to get what you're worth um and uh so you know baseball major league baseball and being a player you got some a lot of nice perks and uh but owners don't like to give away money so i'm sure they want some take backs and you know figure things out but man it, it's so lucrative on both sides it's hard to it's hard to see a scenario where they don't get it worked out before the season starts yeah, that'd be sad if they didn't, because the game of baseball seems to be in such a good place, you know, nationally. Um, you would really hate to see that, to lose any kind of time, especially we've already been through a COVID season and then, you know, the season after yeah. COVID, you know, and then to now have another season kind of, you know, delayed, uh, you know, because of, because of this or a potential strike. I, I really hope it doesn't come to that. But like you said, it is an ugly situation, but I, I appreciate your perspective from a, a player standpoint and the idea that you're doing this for the future. I mean, there was over a, a billion dollars, I think, spent already this off season. So, I mean, money is yeah. money is being spent <laughs> at, at really high levels, and there's still more to be there. And that's why the players are fighting, you know, for that next generation. You know, this generation needs to send their kickback checks over to Dale Murphy because, uh, you know, he he fought for that. Yeah. But no, I didn't. I didn't fight like, you know, the early guys and Kurt Flood and the the whole story, but. Yeah, you're just trying to preserve what you have and the ability, you know, most of our discussions in the 70s and 80s were about free agency and how they were trying to, they, you know, they tried to limit that because it cost them a lot of money. But, um, you know, they have the money and the players benefit and uh, it just seems like now, like you say, there is, is a way to work this out uh, and, and get, you know, everybody will benefit and and I, I'm just really confident. I, like I say, I have no inside information, but man, if we can't get it worked out in today's day and age, that's that's yeah. not going to be a good. I, I, I would say agree with you. Like, 
you know, COVID and weird years and attendance and popularity of the game, it'd really be a shame to, to, you know, to, to, to give that a, you know, uh, to stall that. I think we're right. in a good position right now. Yeah, I don't want to kill that momentum if, if you can avoid it. Um, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. My last question to you. Uh, I'm talking about the future of the Braves. You know, obviously we are talking about Freddie Freeman. Hopefully he's part of that future, but still, there's still a lot of great young talent there with guys like Ronald Acuna Jr. Who, you know, hopefully would come back healthy from that ACL. Um, Ozzie Albies, Austin Riley, Max Freed, Ian Anderson, Hopefully Mike Soroka can come back healthy. I mean, this Braves team is still built, you know, for the future for another potential, you know, World Series run. So yeah. um, just your thoughts, you know, on this young core of talent, you know, what they look like going forward. Can they get back to the World Series, win another World Series? Do you see this as the beginning of a dynasty like the the 90s Braves? Yeah, I think uh, they're, they're set up. But, and the key, I think, is the pitch and the young pitchers you – you mentioned and then supplement that with, you know, veterans like Charlie Morton. I mean, this is a, a if there's one thing that I learned from the eighties uh, with our teams, you know, you, you're built on the depth of your pitching and they have great depth. I don't know what they have in the minor leagues, but I know these pitchers uh, that you mentioned, the young guys that are the core of the staff. And uh, so that'll be the key. Also got some great position players. Uh, Austin Riley, just, you know, what a tremendous breakout year. And then Ronald Acuna come back and Ozzy Albies and Dansby. Um, it, it is, uh, a, I think they're in a position to compete every year. You know, repeating in baseball is, except yeah. for who are the last people to do it, Yankees. But yeah. but winning another World Series, I think, is, is yeah, that's they're, they're going to be competing to get into a World Series. Uh, you know, every year for, you know, the next five to eight years, I would think. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely, definitely what I see. Definitely obviously hopeful for, um, I just want to uh, thank you for, for coming on the show. If there's anywhere, you know, obviously Absolutely. Twitter, and uh, I know you said you do some speaking as well. If there's anything out there you want to let the fans know where they can, they can reach you or follow you. Uh, yeah. Twitter at Dale Murphy three and Dale Murphy.com. Uh, you can reach me there. And uh, my restaurant there over in the uh, in the Cobb Galleria, go go to Merce and get a good cheeseburger. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, Dale, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really uh, do appreciate it. But that will do it for this episode of Locked On thank Braves. You. Be sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Locked On underscore Braves, and you can follow me on Twitter at Shortstop Ball. And that will do it. Again, make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast, and we will talk to you next time.